Welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Voice and the host of Inside Personal Growth. And I have Jim Dieter joining me from Virginia. And he has a new book out, actually just released May 18th, uh, called Choosing Courage, The Everyday Guide to Being Brave at Work. We'll have a link, Jim, for all of our listeners to actually get the book from Amazon. Uh, we'll also put a link to Jim's website as well so that you can go there and check it out. And, you know, it's an interesting topic, and I always let people know a bit about our guest, Jim. Uh, Jim Dieter is the John L. Colley Professor of Business Administration at the University of Virginia's Darden School of Business. Uh, Jim's research focuses on workplace courage, why people speak up or stay silent at work, ethical decision-making and behavior, and other leadership-related topics. Well, it's a pleasure having you on, and this is a topic that I think deserves, uh, at, at this particular time, even with COVID more, um, some uh, heavy discussion. Uh, and I'm sure our people, our listeners will be interested. And you mentioned that the pandemic has created a work environment that requires employees to be courageous, but that many are not speaking up for the fear of retribution. Um, how do you advise frontline employees, hospital workers, people that are in particular hospital workers at this particular time, healthcare workers, I say, become more courageous so that their opinions can be heard? Yeah, thank you, Greg. Thank you for having me. And, and that's a great place to start given the time we have been in and, and remain in. I think probably many of us have, uh, have watched you know, over the last 15 months, uh, so many situations where, you know, it appeared that that relatively powerless or lower level people had to, you know, endure a lot of the risk of the time uh, we're in and uh, felt somewhat voiceless in doing so. And so I think there's, for me, there's really, there's two answers to the question, you know, what do people do in those situations? Uh, one, I think, is to try to create, and, and this is difficult. Um, to try to create um, a conversation around shared goals or shared objectives or the superordinate goal. Um, what is something we both care a lot about? So obviously what tends to be happening, right, if you're talking about healthcare employees or frontline service workers, is that um, there's a pitting of, of interests, right? So obviously those frontline workers in particular care about being safe, uh, while the operators, owners, etc., are also worried about other things like financial viability, continuing to serve customers, right, doing the important work. And so the question is, you know, can those people on the front lines create a conversation uh, that doesn't immediately come off as sort of me against you or my objectives against your objectives? And I think ultimately that's what most of us fear in difficult conversations is that we fear that when we speak up, it's going to be perceived that it's sort of me pitting my interests or objectives against yours. And that's a sort of, that's an obviously confrontational framing. And so I think the question, though hard to do, is whether those frontline workers can find a way into the conversation, you know, where they say, look, I share the same objectives. I know we have a financial reality. I know we want to care for and have to care for our patients. I'm also feeling this way. Are there ways we can... Um, take care of both of those needs. And so for me, a lot of the, the, the entree into being courageous is to try to create a, a path whereby the conversation um, feels like it's a we and we're on the same team conversation as opposed to a, you know, I feel right now I'm losing and I'd like to change the dynamic so that you feel you're losing. You know, that tends not to go very well. Yeah. Well, it's a, you know, it's an interesting dynamic that uh, the having that conversation, right? That people literally have the courage to do it because I think the bigger part is their own psychology around having that courage to step up and do that and to be significant enough, feel significant enough that they want to be heard. And you have read and done lots of research about courage in the workplace. That's uh, kind of your bailiwick. And based on the books, the articles, the research, the papers that you've um, learned about being courageous in the workplace, how would you advise somebody who's listening to us right now and they're saying, um, I just don't have the courage to speak up, Jim? 
yeah, I mean, I'm I'm afraid of my job. I'm afraid of losing my job. I'm afraid of the retribution. Uh, I'm afraid of a lot of things, and I think fear. You know, it's always said fear is that false expectation appearing real. Um, sometimes they the management wants to hear it, but I don't know if they really believe that they I mean somebody believes they want to hear it. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look across, let's say, you know, the the years of research I've done, and also just sticking even to your initial question about, let's say, frontline workers in the pandemic, you know, I think what I've learned is that uh, part of the issue around courage or courageous actions is people um, really thinking longer term than most of us tend to do. So in the short run, it can be very obvious and very real why we're afraid. Um, you know, we fear economic or career consequences. We fear social consequences, psychological consequences, looking stupid. Uh, what we tend to, to overly discount is how will we feel in the long run um, if we don't take action to sort of defend our own sense of self, our, our integrity, if we don't stand up for um, the people who are most important to us. You know, a lot of the question around being courageous or not ultimately relates to longer term regrets uh, or lack thereof and then longer term sense of having the legacy we feel good about or not and it's much harder to keep our eyes on those longer term concepts like regret and legacy when we're fearful in in the moment now again going back to like these frontline workers in the pandemic i think a big part of courage is also uh is saying what am i doing to keep myself um really invaluable to my employer and uh, valuable to other potential employers. Because part of the courage equation is not feeling trapped. You know, I think in the pandemic, one of the things that made it even harder for folks is um, there was a sense that there was no, there was no job mobility, right? We were shedding jobs, we weren't adding jobs. And so that makes it even harder to, to step forward and say, I'm going to do what I think is right or say what needs to be said, and I will live with that. I'll move if I need to. And frankly, one of the most courageous things that people can do is at times say, look, for who I am and what I want for my life, I refuse to be a cog. Um, I have tried. I have tried to create a we. I have tried to uh, be a team player. Um, I have tried to be honest. But that is not being reciprocated, and it's time for me to move. And I, I don't think it's surprising at all that you know, there was a recent uh, Harris poll, I think it was, that showed that 44% of folks um, said uh, just in the last couple of months that they want to change jobs within the next 12 months. Yeah. yeah you know, I think that, that says a lot about what people have concluded about their employers and, and their bosses. Well, it's always been pretty high in this country, if you look at the polls, uh, about um, people's engagement at, at work, right? right? Their level of engagement. And I don't think those polls have actually changed that much in the last couple of years. So we're seeing low levels of engagement because people are dissatisfied. So if you are, you probably should be speaking up because the only way you're going to become satisfied is if you let someone else know that you are dissatisfied with something. You know, and you tell a great story about Stuart Scott, the ESPN flagship anchor and the black American who was outspoken. Uh, can you tell his story and why his actions were so courageous? Yeah, I mean, he's a perfect example of somebody faced with the choice of, do I speak up and, and defend my sense of authenticity and what I stand for? Or do I sort of, you know, shrivel up? Do I, do I silence myself? So Stuart was, you know, the first major black anchor on ESPN Sports Center, the flagship show on ESPN. And he was famous for his turns of phrase, particular types of slang that were very common, very popular in the black community uh, in the U.S., and that made, uh, that obviously attracted a broader audience for ESPN, but it made some folks quite uncomfortable, particularly folks above him at ESPN. And so Stewart was essentially told, tone it down, knock it off. Um, and the sort of implications of that statement were clear to him. And he thought about it a lot and he struggled with that. He understood what he was being told, but he also understood um, what being inauthentic by doing that would mean to him. So. What he decided to do is a, a pretty risky form of a bold move. He actually went on the air and said, hey, 
I want to take this moment to thank uh, the people above me at ESPN for providing a forum for me to connect with a broader audience via the kinds of language I use. Um, it shows a real, you know, it shows a real uh, future orientation and inclusiveness. And of course, by saying that publicly, you know, he he pinned them into a corner. At that point, right. there's a way they could retaliate. Now, uh, I think that's a bold and brilliant move. It's clearly a risky kind of move. Um, that's probably not available to many of us. Yeah, no, not not too many people have that big of an audience. That's right. <laughs> with the with the with the way he did it, but it was a very smart move. But yeah. it it just shows you, even that you know, look that step to go on national TV and do what he did. Um, not only was it clever, but it took a lot of courage because the retribution could have been the opposite. He might have lost the job and. You yeah, know, all kinds of other things. So that's right. And and by the way, there are other, as you know, in in the book, I talk about other examples of people, you know, not well known, not in a big public stage like that, doing similarly bold and clever moves. Like the woman who who was frustrated that every year uh, the strategy team would get together and they'd have a big, you know, presentation, a big deck, and they would wring their hands and say, "Yeah, we're not being bold and creative enough and strategic enough," uh, and they would agree on some things, and then nothing would happen. And so she took a presentation that was three years old uh, and she just changed the date and she presented it again. And uh, everybody shook their heads and said, yeah, this is great, brilliant, and we should really do that. And then she said, um, yeah, actually, that's the identical deck from three years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. that was the move that actually led to the group finally facing how slow and resistant to change they had been. And again, high risk move, but a clever strategy for sort of getting the team unstuck. Very clever. Now, you know, you speak about salary discrimination, which is something that occurs between males and females hired to do the same job. Okay. This is not new. This has been going on since as long as I've been in the workplace. Okay. The question is, it was brushed under the carpet most of the time and now has become much more of an issue, including the issue of um, sexual biases, right? So how does one get the courage to stand up for salary if they're being salary discriminated against? And speak about the truth to power, please. Yeah, so, you know, whether it's salary discrimination or any other form of discrimination, whether it's based on, on gender, race, or any, you know, sort of category not related to core performance, um, yeah, the issue, right, is how do you affect change? And one of the things I think is crucial in those conversations is first getting clear with yourself what's your objective. So what I've learned from studying those kinds of cases is that people uh, implicitly sometimes, and I think it's useful for it to be explicitly considered, they are deciding between, uh, am I speaking up to get my salary adjusted or my promotion opportunity addressed, or to help us systematically, systemically address the bias in the organization. And if you think about it, um, the things you might say and how you might go about it are really different if you were deciding to focus on your paycheck versus women's paycheck, let's say in the organization. And so I think that's one thing, being really clear on what's your objective. Um, in, in either case, I think the key is, again, uh, as Catherine Gill, who is one of the people I profile in the book, she was really a master of this. She was the only senior female on the, the very top team at her organization for a long time. And what she realized is that until she both physically and emotionally sort of pulled her chair around to the other side of the table, you know, that is really sat with them and created a we situation, um, every time she spoke up about uh, gender issues was going to be perceived as a me versus you conversation. Right. That implicitly is a right versus wrong uh, framing. And so uh, one of the things she really did is she tried to keep it data focused. And I think that's what's so crucial. You know, when you're talking about things like any form of discrimination, uh, what you're essentially doing is questioning the target, the person you're speaking to's character or integrity, right? Because you know, there's really no way around the fact that if you are told, hey, Greg, you are paying me less as a woman or as a minority, that that is at some level an implicit attack on your character. Yeah. And so I think, you know, 
working really hard and smart to say, let's be data driven. Um, let's just look at numbers. Uh, and what Catherine Gilligan was really brilliant at is, although she had sort of a line of women outside her door saying, you know, please help me speak up about this, that or whatever. She was also really known by the males in the organization as someone who, when she studied the issue, and she didn't find there was pay discrimination or promotion discrimination, she would say to the specific women, hey, this dog doesn't bark. So I think one of the things you do if you want to speak truth to power is you, about a certain issue, is that you have to have established over time that you are fair, that you are reasonable. Credible. It, it, credible, right? It's it's much, much harder to dismiss a person who a hundred times you've called highly credible as suddenly not credible because you don't like the particular issue they're speaking Yeah, about. Yeah, I know. And, and, you know, I think important to this book is these 30 behaviors that people should adapt to be heard. Um, probably, I'm going to say it, it's a key point in the book. And one of them is candid conversations. Now, you've talked about it to a degree. The question is behind camera conversations. How do we best approach a peer when we need to have a candid conversation about anything? But in this case, I used inappropriate behavior, um, you know, uh, sexual discrimination, um, you know, candid conversation that's not right. Now we're seeing these candid conversations actually uh come out in the media, especially if it's a high profile person. Yeah. I mean, we have the governor of New York, we've got, you know, I the litany of people that I could say, uh, why did you go all the way to the media like that to have that candid? You waited way too long to allow that candid conversation to occur, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, like in, in the case of uh, the governor of New York, now we're back in sort of a power hierarchy, a power differential situation, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so I think the answer there or the explanation there is often fear, right? People were were terrified of, of having their careers ruined. And I think that goes to the heart of, you know, what I've identified, you know, you mentioned 35 different behaviors that I've identified over the years as seen as courageous in organizations. And while the truth to power, right, speaking up to somebody above you in the organization is the sort of prototype, it's the one we all think about. Uh, there are about 25 other kinds of behaviors that are not fundamentally about sort of truth to power. They're about honest conversations with peers or subordinates or external stakeholders. They're about taking stretch assignments, doing other bold actions, uh, standing on principle, being innovative. Lots of things that are not just about truth to power. And the reason those are also so difficult is we don't actually just fear. You know, we, we can assume, right, in the case of, let's say, the governor examples or many of the public uh, profile ones, the Harvey Weinstein, we can assume that the primary risks or fears were um, economic or career, right? They didn't want to be derailed. But in so many other workplace situations, what people are really afraid of are social consequences. They don't want to be isolated, ostracized, sort of kicked out of the group. Um, psychological, they don't want to look stupid, be embarrassed in front of others. Um, and in too many cases, even physical, right? They don't want to be accosted in one way or another. So there are so many fears um, that get in the way of these important behaviors. And that's why you need strategies um, to overcome these. Not just because you need the strategies to be willing to do it, but to sort of minimize the likelihood of negative retribution to yourself and increase the likelihood that something positive happens. Yeah, you know, these high profile cases, though, they're actually good case studies. And I'm going to bring one up. And that's uh, the officer, Derek Chauvin, just convicted a murder of George Floyd, has many inappropriate behaviors prior to him killing George Floyd. We know that. This yeah. guy had a history of, pardon me, shit he was doing that he shouldn't have been doing as an officer. And that's probably one of the reasons that added to him being convicted. You know, when you you know, when you can string, uh, when a prosecution can string stuff like that together, they can get somebody convicted. So when one's actions are so abrasive, um, like in Derek Chauvin, and how would a fellow employee approach his superiors to get some positive action taken? Now, I don't think too many people spoke out about Derek. 
I think what happened is Derek was doing this. And let's face it, our police forces are under siege right now. Doesn't matter where it is. Uh, I, there's probably not a place in, in this country that isn't seeing inappropriate behavior. Um, and this is a big one. And I think for the people working underneath him or with him or those other guys that are being convicted with him, I bet you they wish they had spoken out sooner. Yeah, you know, this is a case where it, it, this is a, a great illustration. Um, and, and, you know, right now there's so much attention on police forces, but police forces are just one example of an occupation where this is where this is common, where the sort of the loyalty toward one's brothers, if you will, or one's fellow members of the right. occupation is so strong um, that the loyalty to one's brothers, if you will, gets in the way at times of one's loyalty to the profession itself, um, to the mission, right, to the people one serves. And when I say it's broader than, I mean, we, we know that this is true in, you know, they're in higher education context or K-12 context. You know, there are lots of contexts where um, we we defend ourselves, it seems, rather than focus on um, rooting out problems within ourselves mm -hmm. that get in the way of the respect or credibility. And so, you know, it's actually, what it's, it's it was well documented before, you know, these particular moments um, now, you know, a year ago and three or four years ago. It's been well documented for a long time. Um, that police are one of those cultures where sort of your loyalty to your brethren um, gets in the way of rooting out problematic mm -hmm. elements. And so it's a little hard to say, you know, in that context, whether the issue is, you know, that captains, you know, superiors wouldn't act when others spoke up about each other or whether uh, people just didn't speak up. Um, not because they were afraid of their boss, but because, again, this social fear, this sense that you do not rat out others, right. um, is so pervasive. And so I think when people are talking about changing the culture of policing, a lot of it's probably less about changing a culture of fear of speaking up than it is about a culture of speaking honestly you know, to each other. Yeah, um, makes sense. You know, you see that, for example, uh, sports is another context, right? You know... Uh, there are some positive examples of folks really speaking out about certain, you know, locker room behaviors, types of, you know, locker room behavior, for example, that might have been really demeaning to women for far too long. Um, and, you know, the solution to that is not that, you know, players probably go and rat out others to the coach. The solution is that players learn to start confronting each other. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not certain that you know it's a dominated by male uh, behavior, but most of the vocations that you just spoke of, including police um, and sports, so we're talking baseball, basketball. It's a male-dominated sport, and there's an underwritten rule that has been carried on from generation to generation, that that's not what you do, right? Um, and so I think it's kind of tough. And in your chapter on choosing your battles, you mentioned that when we're emotionally charged, our brains narrow their focus to the present issue, which makes it hard to think about the larger picture, including what might be gained or lost in the long run. Um, what would you advise to our listeners when put into this position and how um, would they evaluate the situation? Yeah, I think here the advice, uh, very easy to say and much harder to do, is to recognize the distinction between your emotions as an indicator that something is worth carefully exploring, thinking about examining, versus your emotions as an indicator that you should immediately act. You know, our, our emotions, right, for sure exist um, to alert us to potential threats um, or other, you know, salient aspects of the environment that are crucial to us. Um, but they're far from perfect. So, you know, every time you're in a meeting and somebody says something that immediately creates a flash of anger, um, that's not necessarily a sign that it's an important thing for you to speak up or do something about. Uh, and so I think learning to sort of slow yourself down in the moment enough to say, uh, I should evaluate consciously what's going on in this emotional reaction situation is what's crucial. And, 
you yeah, know, we don't look, react. Don't react from emotion. Actually, yeah, you know, that's use, right. use your logic. Think through something. You know, we always say, take a deep breath. You know, it, right. usually what creates arguments is immediate reaction. It's a reaction, not action. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and, and sometimes it's difficult. But one of the things that does slow the process down, it's been proven, is people kind of go take three, four, five long, deep breaths, you know, before yeah. you blurt out what you're going to blurt out, allow your mind to process what just happened, right? Versus just this knee-jerk emotional reaction that goes, oh, retribution, I'm going to just lash out at whomever for whatever. So I think that's important. I think um, that's, yeah. Because, you know, for two reasons. One, um, even if you conclude after you count to 10 or take three or four slow breaths or right. jot down a note, even if you conclude, yeah, this is an important thing, you'll likely do it in a more competent way. Right? Because one of the things I care a lot about is not just having people you know, speak up more, be more courageous, but doing it in a competent way. And uh, the likelihood that you do so more competently is so much enhanced once you sort of slow your emotional reaction down a little bit. And the second thing that might happen is if you slow yourself down a little bit, you might conclude, yeah, this is a little bothersome or troublesome, uh, but I only have so many opportunities to really be heard and listened to or to get resources. This is, yeah, this upset me, but it's not the moment. It's not the most important issue. And so, you know, just keep quiet. Yeah, good, good point. Um, great book, Jim. And I'm going to end the, our conversation on a note that I usually do. Uh, for my listeners, Choosing Courage is the book that uh, we'll be uh, having a link to Amazon, uh, The Everyday Guide to Being Brave at Work. This is a course uh, that Jim actually teaches at the Darden School, and it's a um, master's course, right? Your master's MBA, exactly. MBA. Yep. Yeah. So if you were to leave these listeners who are out there now in middle management, upper management, because that's where we get a lot of our listeners from, um, what three major points from your book would you want them to take away and what could be useful for them in the work environment uh, and how can they apply it? Yeah, sure. So, so first what I would say is um, a lot of uh, becoming more courageous, whether it's in ourself or others, is actually dispelling some myths. So one key myth is to let go of the idea um, that courage is some kind of trait or natural born ability. And that's just simply not true. I've looked carefully at the research. Um, courageous actions come from all kinds of people, all personalities, all demographics. Um, courageous action is a choice. So the first thing we have to all do is stop excusing ourselves because we think we're not the right type. None of us are any more or less the right type. It's a set of learned skills that we should sort of accept the responsibility for. The second thing I would say is um, the fact that you feel afraid doesn't mean you can't or shouldn't act courageously. It means you're normal. Um, every reasonable person has things they fear, whether they're economic or social or psychological. So it really just means the stage is set um, for you to take those next steps. Um, the third thing I would say is uh, that's important to remember that courageous actions aren't just the scariest kinds of things um, that are most likely to come to mind. So yes, we're most likely to think of those whistleblower scenarios we read about in the paper, see on the news. And when we do that, that, that makes us think that like choosing courage is also about choosing to be an organizational martyr. And then of course people won't do that. I think what I would remind everybody is that there are so many smaller things that are still really important in workplaces. Conversations with peers or subordinates or just non-confrontational feedback you could give your boss. And so I recommend building a courage ladder. Um, when you build a ladder, right, because there are rungs from lowest to highest, um, it helps you get clarity. Oh yeah, that's that really scary thing for me at the top. But here's a set of much more manageable action steps I could take. And then like anybody sort of training or developing skills in any domain, you actually start at the bottom. You start with easy manageable tasks because that helps you build some success and keep your motivation going. So I encourage people not to think of courage as these big, heroic, impossible acts. 
but these very manageable things that we are all responsible for doing and that we are all capable of doing. That's a good way to kind of wrap up the, the book. And again, for my listeners, there'll be a link on our blog, uh, Choosing Courage. You're going to want to go out and get a copy of this book, especially if you're, I, I'd say even mid-management, upper management, but anybody who's uh, trying to develop that courage muscle, you know, how are we going to make that happen? And I think much of that courage, Jim, just from my commentary at the, here at the end of the interview, um, it starts with listening and communications. And if you're an elevated communicator, meaning somebody who's doing this with more emotional intelligence, with more compassion, with more understanding, you're more likely to be heard when you're, it's your time to step up and be brave and move something forward or move the needle forward um, that needs to do that. So uh, a plug-in here, actually, uh, there's a podcast from Marianne O'Brien on a book, a Simon & Schuster book called The Elevated Communicator. And I think when you know other people's style of communication, how are they expressive or they, whatever category they fit in, you have the ability then to know how to approach that person with much more ease and much more courage. Um, and I would say that you know, in combination with Jim's podcast here, listen to the other podcast with Marianne Williamson as well about becoming an elevated communicator in the workplace, because that's going to give you the courage when you know your style and other people's styles. But do go, uh, Jim, what website would you like for them to go to learn more about it? Is it just jimdeter.com? Yep, just J I M D E T E R T dot com. Yep. Jim Dieter. There you go. So we'll put a link to jimdieter.com. This is a Harvard Business Review Press book. Um, you can also go there and find the book on their website. But more than likely, you're probably going to go to the default Amazon. Is it in uh, audiobook yet? Is it in Kindle? It's in all, all formats. Yep. Okay, so you'll have an audiobook, a, a Kindle book, uh, and the paperback version well i have a paperback i think it is in hardback now right is that correct? It's correct correct okay. well jim thanks for being on inside personal growth and spending a few minutes with my listeners uh discussing your new book and how to have the courage to speak up in the workplace to get something that's bothering you fixed amen <laughs>